Um, so hi everyone, I'm Sandra Bell from Friends of the Earth and I've been working really closely with um, colleagues Ashton on the case studies which has been a great experience um, and thanks also to everyone Ashton for uh, organising this fantastic event today. I uh, also want to kind of say thank you to um, all the councils that have been involved, um, not only the councils that have been presenting today but all the councils who gave their time to uh, put these case studies together and also the other partners we've been working with like ADEPT. Um, I think that you know we've come up with a, a fantastic resource for um, for councils, for community groups and policymakers alike. Um, so as Matt mentioned, I'm going to run quickly through some overarching lessons that we've learned from the case studies. Um, I'm then going to hand over to Steve Reed of West Sussex County Council and also representing ADAPT for a local authority perspective. Um, and then we're going to have a, a short uh, Q&A at the end, which will be facilitated by uh, Rose Taylor from Friends of the Earth. Okay, so... Um, if you've been to uh, some of our earlier, some of the sessions today, you will have seen that um, each of the case study has its own tips and lessons. Um, but we've also drawn out these overarching lessons from across the case studies. And the first one of those is um, that local action works. So uh, the impacts reported in our case studies really reinforce what we know about the importance of local authority action in meeting climate targets. Uh, so just to kind of pull out an example of that, Cambridgeshire County Council's latest solar farm will save 90,000 tonnes of CO2 emissions over its 25-year lifespan, as well as generating income for the council. But really importantly, as you will have heard from the sessions today, councils are demonstrating wider co-benefits too. So lower fuel bills and warmer homes in winter, as North East Derbyshire Council found when they insulated council homes in ex-mining communities, more equal access to green space and nature, um, and new green skills and jobs, and multiple health benefits from more walking to healthier diets in schools. And on diet, uh, an example there is Leeds City Council, which is helping schools to switch to low carbon meals with more plant-based food, which is in line with official healthy eating guidance. So our second lesson is that councils need to start somewhere. So we're really aware that some councils are struggling to get off the starting blocks. And we found that actions focused on the council's own operations are a good starting point. But actually, they can also have a wide impact by demonstrating to local businesses, institutions and residents what's possible. So, for example, Leeds City Council is making all its vehicles electric for its own fleet, but it's also helping residents and businesses do the same. Brighton and Hove City Council is pioneering electric cargo bike deliveries for their own deliveries, but they're also um, helping businesses like Brighton Gin to do the same. And Durham County Council, as you've just heard, reduced waste uh, with a ban on single-use plastic in council offices and premises, but, but also inspired the wider community to, to take action too. So our next lesson is that there is money to be had and we're very aware that uh, councils are really strong, struggling with funding at the moment. Funding is a major challenge to uh, increase climate ambition locally, but some councils have found innovative ways to, to fund climate change. Um, some of you will have heard earlier about the case from Warrington Borough Council, which raised £1 million using community municipal bonds uh, to fund a solar farm. Um, members of the public can invest as little as £5, which engages people in the project as well as raising money for it. Um, so some councils have been successful in securing national government funds, although this can be re a really labour intensive exercise. So Leicester City Council uh, obtained around £40 million funding from the Department for Transport uh, to transform travel in the city, including um, an electric bus network, new bus lanes and uh, extensive new walking and cycling routes. And climate action can also save money in the medium to long term. So Darian Straban Council estimates that by adopting circular economy principles, they going, they're going to save uh, £3.1 million a year. So talking of the challenges of funding kind of leads me on to the next lesson. And you've kind of heard some of this through the day today as well, that councils really do need more support from national government. Um, some councils are clearly showing what's possible. 
but even those that have obtained funding are having to kind of choose where to put their resources rather than tackle climate in a more comprehensive way. And we found a plethora of different funding pots through these case studies being used, mostly competitive and some funding schemes that are no longer available. So it's a really complex picture for councils. So it's really important that there is more long term stable funding um, from national governments. And the case studies also revealed how policy reform in areas such as planning would empower more councils to take action. So we heard about Stroud District Council, which has a really proactive approach to finding space for onshore wind. Um, but that's in spite of rather than actually being backed by the national planning policy framework. Um, and so we, we urgently need reform of, of planning policy for onshore wind to remove those barriers to, to onshore wind being allocated in local plans and to help to boost uh, supplies of cheaper renewable energy. York City Council with its scheme to build uh, zero carbon homes to the passive house standard um, certainly also kind of reflected that having higher national building regulation standards in place would have kind of helped smooth the way for that project too. So this need for more backing for, for funding and, and policy change led Kingston Council to sign the blueprint. Some of you would have heard more about the blueprint earlier. This is a set of priorities backed by NGOs, councils and researchers, including ADAPT, Ashton and Friends of the Earth, calling for more resources, regulatory powers and regulatory powers for councils. And we'd really encourage councils to sign up to that because the more councils that put their name to it, the more power there will be behind it. So the next lesson is that there's a green skills gap that needs to be filled. This came across from, from a lot of the case studies that there's a huge potential to create green jobs and climate action, but there is still this massive gap in terms of green skills. And some councils are acting uh, to address that gap. So Greater Manchester, uh, for example, is uh, Identify, working with local employers to identify the skills gaps and to fill those as part of its smart energy plan, including a dedicated retrofit skills hub. Um, Dundee City Council's backing for green skills, skills training is linking up with local universities and colleges, um, and that's helping to attract investment into the city in renewables and providing opportunities for local people. And again, City of York um, is so in their, their passive house housing. They're working with local colleges to train up lecturers in, in passive house techniques, but also uh, directly offering courses to, to help gas engineers uh, to uh, change their skills to, to fitting heat pumps. So the next important lesson is to get the whole council on board. We found that where there's buying from across the council, climate action is more successful. So including getting officers involved across the, the council departments, um, as well as strong political leadership and vision. So Cotswold Council, for example, appointed climate champions to spread the word across council officers. And that's really led to a change of culture and reporting on climate impacts on decisions is now considered normal. And political leadership was really important in uh, Burnley's council's uh, initiative to make their, their parks and spaces wilder and benefit by diversity as uh, councillors had to be on the front line of, of kind of initial um, complaints before residents got used to the idea that, that this was an initiative that was going to actually make those spaces better and, and better for wildlife. Our next lesson is to partner up. Um, many of the successful case studies involved key partnerships um, and those may be helping the council bid for funds, tap into expertise, engage with the wider community or share delivery of the project. So Hastings Council, for example, partnered with other councils, particularly bringing in public health departments to set up their warm homes check service and Hull City Council partnered up with Yorkshire Water um, and used their billing department in fact to help them kind of reach out more widely into the community as well as tapping into existing community groups. And the last kind of overarching lesson really, and you've heard a lot of this if you've been with us throughout the day, is the importance of engaging early and involving communities in climate decision making. Some policies won't be popular, but we certainly found that early engagement with communities, discussion of co-benefits and a genuine commitment to, to listening to the public helped to gain acceptance. And um, some of you will have heard in, in detail the, the example from Waltham Forest where uh, early engagement and physical trials of their measures helped to 
to gain acceptance for uh, low traffic neighborhood measures. And citizens, citizens assemblies uh, like that run by uh, Blenel Gwent Council can really help to identify priorities together with the community and uh, have gain more acceptance as the plans go forward. So just on that theme of community engagement, I just wanted to, to mention again, so we've referred to our uh, Council 54, 50 point plan um, that the case studies are based on. We very much see that as a tool for collaboration between councils and community groups and our own action groups. So as campaigners, our 300 local climate action groups will keep pushing councils to do more, of course, that's their role, but they also very much work together with the councils to achieve common aims. So Lambeth Friends of the Earth, for example, is part of the council's Community Climate Forum, Eastbourne Eco Action Network, uh, set up a, an online platform to help the council to seek residents' views on a green and fair recovery. And similarly, Warwickshire Climate Alliance coordinated the community response to the council's action plan. So that was a really quick run through the lessons that we've learned and it was impossible to refer to every case study. So do go and check out all the, the, all the case studies if you haven't done so already. I just wanted to really quickly flag up um, our postcode tool called Near You, uh, which is a tool that's useful for community groups and councils. So here you can find uh, data on the progress in your area on many of the issues that we've covered um, in today's webinar. Um, so I think Rose is gonna pop a, a link to that in the chat box. So thanks for listening and um, I'm going to hand over now to Steve Reed from ADAPT. And sorry, I've just got to stop sharing my screen as well. There you go. Thank you very much, uh, Sandra, for that uh, really interesting run through. Now, here's the bit where I have to start to share my screen, which hopefully won't take too long. And all being well. If I actually launch this, we will get underway. There we go. So hopefully you're just now seeing uh, my introductory slide and uh, I'm Steve Reed. I'm very fortunate to chair ADEPT's Environment Board. And uh, for the rest of the time, I'm uh, Director of uh, Environment and Public Protection at West Sussex County Council. And I've just got five minutes to sort of give some reflections on uh, uh, what it's like from a, a council point of view, probably. So I will just briefly reflect on the immense value of learning. And I think there are two main points here. One is that what we can take from others having been on the journey before us, uh, answering uh, specific questions uh, without us having to go out and uh, research that from scratch, because very often there are complex uh, financial, legal, possibly uh, taxation questions. There are things around human resources in deciding how we're going to uh, take a particular approach to things. And I've been able to, for example, draw from the experience of Leeds City Council and their electrification of their fleet as I've been uh, looking at that with uh, a group of people within West Sussex County Council. And it's another interesting phenomena, isn't it, that we uh, are bringing people together to solve problems that uh, perhaps would never have uh, necessarily come together from different fields such as finance, HR, our fleet managers, our uh, uh, FM managers to say, right, we've got a whole new paradigm here in terms of the way we're going to operate our fleet. How, how do we move into that uh, area? But there's also, I think, the value of learning uh, the, from these case studies, from the sort of sheer inspiration, the broadening of our perspective, the looking at the art of the possible, and not necessarily just taking those ideas, but sparking ideas uh, to develop them or take a slightly different angle in order to fit our own circumstances. But I'm going to deviate now into something perhaps slightly uh, on the face of it might seem a little bit more negative, but I think I think it's important to understand it, that I've had a suspicion for quite a long time, and this goes back to the early days of uh, local authority recycling 20 years ago, when I got thrown into that world and into the sort of 
uh, best practice uh, examples in that field. And it was sometimes hard to get other people to really catch the vision. What is it about other people's best practice that actually we're not terribly interested in, or some of our colleagues or uh, some of our elected members maybe? I think it's really important to perhaps understand the roots of some of these anxieties. Uh, there is the classic, well, it's not invented here. It's really important for me to be uh, projecting my ideas and I don't really want to take something that's secondhand from somewhere else. And also there's a political angle in that maybe if the opposition suggests it, then if we do it, they'll take the credit for it and we won't. Uh, there's the control. There's the, gosh, if you get into all this kind of thing, you'll give people ideas and I'm already overworked and uh, there's, there's too many expectations and this will just create more. This will be stress. This will be difficult and uh, not unnatural if you're in that situation to be wary of more things being thrown at you. Perhaps also if they come in a random way, which doesn't actually have a great deal of chance of getting uh, traction. Uh, there's the old uh, adage isn't there we'll never consult anybody unless you know what the answer is going to be well I think we need to be braver than that and many of the examples uh, that we've seen today are very much in that category is actually if you go out and consult people appreciate it and sometimes you might not get a, 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 an easy answer but on the other hand that is a point to move forward from and there's what I call the myth of fingerprints so if you're old enough uh, 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 to remember uh, the Paul Simon Graceland's album them. There's a line in there that I've always uh, found was fascinating about the myth of fingerprints. What it's basically saying is that actually, uh, when you look in absolute minute detail, there may be differences between us, but actually step back, uh, we're all human beings and there are many things that, uh, you know, that, that, that are the same. And I think it's the same for councils. I think many councils sometimes think, well, we, we're special here. We can't do it that way. And then there's the worry, well, it's all on me. It's another aspect of that control thing, really. Um, you know, uh, there's a small team here. I, 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 I can't take this forward alone. So on the positive side, well, how do we do this and I think the, the 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 really important thing is you know we're in this together that's been a theme of today uh, and I think it's important that we all understand what the root of the anxiety might be in taking things forward whether that's uh, officers within a council looking at our own setup and saying what well, why is there this reluctance among our elected members or colleagues or uh, or whoever? And how do we address that? And how do we set realistic expectations that are still challenging? How do we create a, 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 a vision, uh, as Sandra uh, put it earlier? How do we uh, give that uh, confidence that we can do this within the resource envelope and from that step move to seeking more resources from whatever uh, source uh, available. And again, we've seen so many good examples of how people have found resource uh, from so many uh, places. Uh, it's about honest discussion around the art of the possible. Uh, many of these local authorities, examples that that uh, Sandra was talking about, and you can read in the uh, uh, in the publication, you know, that we, we can't all be good at absolutely everything. We need to take things one step at a time, build on what we're good at and, and, and draw in more ideas and, and, and go off in different directions uh, when we have the resource and the confidence to do that, but to do that purposefully. Who do we ask for help? Well, of course, you know, again, we've seen so many examples of that. For us as a county council, as an upper tier authority, we have to work with our district and borough uh, colleagues. We have to work with the South Downs National Park and uh, AONBs within our area, with the Wildlife Trust, with the Local Nature Partnership, with community groups, with activists, with businesses, with local academia, all of those and many others, including residents. Uh, the key point is, as an upper tier authority, our role is often to empower and join people up and make those kind of connections, uh, not necessarily to interfere. We can be that anchor partner in a bid. Uh, we can use our skills to bring people together in a room and say, uh, you know, how, how, do we, uh, how do we take this forward? How can we support you to take that forward? And finally, relationships. Relationships, of course, are absolutely everything. They can be complex, they can be frustrating, uh, but that 
trust and shared ownership of this agenda is absolutely the most important thing and the platform for all progress. So I'm going to stop at this point and uh, hand back to Sandra, but I, I hope you found that uh, an interesting perspective at the, uh, at the end of the session. Thank you, Steve um, and Sandra. That was a really wonderful way to kind of bring together everything that we've looked at today um, into one very neat package. Um, so I'm going to invite Sandra to turn your camera back on. That's great. And we've got a few minutes now for just our final Q&A before we wrap up. Um, so if anyone would like to ask any final questions to Sandra or Steve, um, please do add them to the Q&A box. You just click Q&A along the bottom and add your question there. Um, Sandra in her presentation also mentioned the network of over 300 climate action groups that we have working with um, local authorities on climate action and I know we do have um, some of you on this call as well so if anyone from a climate action group would like to come in and say a little bit about the work that, that you do with your local authority to kind of share the importance of that, that community engagement um, please do let us know in the chat box or put your hand up and we can bring you in to share for a couple of minutes. Um, but I'm not seeing any questions in the chat box, so do, do please add them. Um, and yeah, let us know if you want to come in. But Steve and Sandra, I wonder if you want to just say a little bit more, particularly on that, that theme of community engagement, because it's something that's come up in a lot of um, the case studies throughout the day, um, and how that can kind of be done in a, in a meaningful way. Because um, I know it's tricky, tricky terrain to manage. So I don't know if one of you wants to come in and say a little bit more about that. Thanks, Rose. Um, sorry, I was also just wondering, you know, if uh, if none of our climate action groups want to come in, whether sort of similarly, if any councils that have got some positive experiences of working with uh, campaign groups wanted to kind of share any experience. Um, I think, you know, probably drawing from, you know, what we've seen from the case studies, I think, you know, the, the, the kind of top tips are, you know, definitely engage early. I think that's come out from a lot of what we've heard in the sessions today that, you know, you kind of go out, if you go out and talk to the community early on, um, then that's kind of really crucial to kind of having that, that meaningful discussion, um, taking, being honest, I think, I think that's something else that's come out, you know, just be honest about some of the challenges and the kind of aspects of, of what we're trying to do that might, that what you're trying to do that might not be so popular. Um, I think another really key one, um, obviously from a, a Friends of the Earth perspective as well, is that it's really important to uh, really try to reach out to those kind of more vulnerable communities who might not be the most vocal people in your community, um, but are probably going to be the people that are most impacted by climate change. So uh, finding really good ways to kind of reach out to, to those kind of people. And I think in the case studies that we've put together, Hull um, City Council uh, has certainly been, that's one of the things that they've been really trying to focus on to kind of reach out to particularly vulnerable communities that are threatened by flooding. Um, so yeah, but if anybody else wants to kind of come in with additional thoughts on that, that would be great. We've got a sort of follow on question um, to that from Sam, um, which we will try and tackle in the last sort of two minutes, um, but it's around onshore wind and community engagement. Um, so I understand community engagement is necessary, but how do we get around the issue where a really suitable site can be rejected because of opposition from a small minority? Um, as I've been told, you need 100% backing. Sandra or Steve, do either of you want to attempt to tackle that in, in a minute or so? Uh, I, sorry, Sandra, go ahead. Uh, sorry, you go first. <laughs> well, I, I was, I was going to fess up and say, really, um, I, I, I don't know about the 100% the backing. Uh, that seems like a very high bar. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sure it's right. Uh, it's, it's not something uh, we, we've done in West Sussex. We've done a, a huge amount around solar uh, with two solar farms and certainly you don't need to, uh, to, to, to reach that kind of high bar. 
but uh, at the end of the day, if some people have made their mind up about something, uh, it's going to be quite difficult to shift them. And my, my general point around um, engagement and consultation is, is really just developing one that Sandra said, which is actually, you know, f putting a face to it, actually going out and talking to people and meeting people uh, rather than just uh, putting out a, an online questionnaire or, uh, uh, you know, uh, putting out a press release saying you can go to, to so and so if you've got some views on this actually going out and positively engaging and trying to get people uh, to engage will gain you a lot of kudos and a lot of credit even with people who don't necessarily uh, want to agree or, or uh, start off agreeing with you so um, I can't answer very very specifically but uh, I think you know that that human interaction is is really really important just to thank Steve and we're running out of time so sorry Rosa if that's all right I'll just really quickly come in on this I think um, Stroud is you know I think there's a reason that Stroud is one of the very few councils that that has got in its local has allocated space for onshore wind in its local plan um, and it had to go through um, quite an extensive process uh, and costly process of gathering the evidence uh, to back that up um, it also did they also did do quite a lot of outreach with parish councils and with the local youth council to to kind of to, to, to get that support but yes I mean ultimately you're right there is this huge um, hoop that you have to go through in terms of proving community sport you know uh, fossil fuel um, extraction doesn't have the same high uh, high requirements um, as onshore wind in planning terms which is a crazy situation and it's one that we are campaigning to try to change particularly as at the moment the leveling up and regeneration bill is going through parliament um, and it contains planning reforms and uh, one of the key things that the blueprint um, has been calling for is that the plan system has to be much better aligned with the Climate Change Act and uh, climate targets and, and budgets. So that's something that, that through the blueprint we'll continue to push for. Thank you, Sandra. Um, we are out of time now. So apologies if we didn't get to your question, but thank you very much to everyone for your really insightful questions. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Simon now just for some closing words. Great, thanks Rose, and thank you uh, Rose, Steve and Sandra for some really insightful conversations and trying to bring it all together. Uh, I think, you know, when I started off this morning, I was feeling quite gloomy having looking at the news uh, and looking about what's going on in the world of climate, but wow, I'm not sure about you, I kind of feel excited and energised what I've heard today and hugely motivated now about getting the work done. And Sandra, thanks so much for the key lessons and Steve, your really helpful thoughts. I think given the scale and uh, the climate crisis, we do need to be learning together so that we don't waste time reinventing the wheel and that we can build partnerships that help us get there further and faster. And it all just shows what is possible and that we have most of those solutions already. Inspiring projects like these just need to be adapted and scaled right across the UK. And it's not, of course, just about climate actions, it's about all the raft of social, economic and environmental benefits that improve people's lives too at the same time. So if you remember, if you were good right at the start, I asked you to imagine at the opening of today what it might like be if you stitch together all of these projects in one place. Well, certainly for me, I'd like to move there right now. It's a really inspiring look at what we could be. And also Mike kicked us off today on our armour gloomy note saying that national government wasn't really understanding uh, the role of local authorities in delivering climate change. Well, actually, a report's just been published today from PricewaterhouseCoopers at Innovate UK. I just shared the link in the chat. It shows that every one pound invested in local net zero energy uh, slashes costs by almost two pounds. And at the same time, every one pound that delivered gives us more than 14 pounds worth of community benefit. So that is some return on investment and bang for your buck. So perhaps we need to make sure that government can hear that message too. So all that's left to say is thank you all for coming today. Just a reminder that you can find all the case studies in line. We will share the recordings of the session with you today. Thanks to all our amazing speakers who've given up their time and the brilliant team from Ashton, Friends of the Earth, who created the case studies and ran this event. Thank you to all the councils who took their time out to talk to you today and share their learning. Please do share them wherever you can. 
Thank you for being so generous in your support and sharing your learning with each other. The chat has been on fire today and uh, we're going to go through that with a forensic tooth comb for ourselves too. So do fill in the final poll that Emma asked you to. It's really important to help us fund programmes like these. Keep sharing the case studies. The more you share, the more people can adapt and learn. And thank you for coming. We hope you all have lovely evenings. Thank you so much.